so we have some young people in this room, but we have also quite a few seasoned folks sitting around the room. So I'd love you to tell us, first of all, what esports are and give us an example or two. Um, well, first, thank you for having me here. And uh, the conversation we were having a little bit earlier is you're only as old as you feel. Um, I mean, I'm in an industry where retirement age is about 25. Right. So I stick with that. I always tell people I'm 25 years old with 16 years of experience. <laughs> so we stick with that. Um, what is esports? This is something we've had to work with a lot uh, in Saudi when we were first getting started. Explaining to parents what is esports. You know, the question we got the most often is why is my child at home watching someone else play a game? And the first question I used to ask is, did you watch the football match yesterday? And they said, yes. I said, well, it's the exact same thing. Um, they are watching the professionals in their sport play their sport. Um, it is more than just sitting down in front of a screen and you know, kicking a few buttons. It, it's tactics, it's uh, community, it's social. Uh, and it's, it's a phenomenon that, I mean, really, as the world grows, and as long as we have children, uh, gaming is going to be a part of their lives. And it's just an evolution. You know, gaming has been there since the beginning of time in different forms, throwing rocks, playing with sticks. Digital gaming is just the next version. Um, and it's exciting to see that become a professional sport mm -hmm. and see our, our athletes really become true athletes. So I wonder how many of the folks here in the room consider themselves a gamer? <coughs> Okay, we've got a few, all right. Who of you don't consider yourself a gamer? All right, put your hand down if you've ever played Wordle. Okay, or Candy Crush. All right, there's a few left, but not too many. Princess Rima, do you consider yourself a gamer? <laughs> all right, got somebody to win over today. So tell us why you think this is a revolution in digital entertainment, not just another flash in the pan. Well, one of the things that I get very excited about when we talk about game development and game creation and what we're doing in Saudi is there is no more immersive medium than gaming. When you watch a movie, you're watching something someone else is doing. When you read a book, you're reading about something someone has already done. But when you're playing a game, you are doing it yourself. You are living that experience. Um, and so as a way to talk to people, to teach, to teach a culture. Uh, I mean, there's, um, there's a game that I played growing up called uh, Dynasty Warriors. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about Chinese history and the unification of China. And the first time I ever went to China, and we were doing a, a tour of some of the old sites, and they were telling us about some of the battles. I said, oh yeah, this is the one where this general did this. And they looked at me, how did you know that? I said, well, I've been playing the game for about 10 years. <laughs> um, the story my wife hates me to tell is there's a game called Assassin's Creed. It was one of the episodes was based in, in Italy. And I went on a trip with my wife to Italy. And as we were walking around, she asked me, what's this building? And I said, oh, this is so-and-so's, uh, used to be so-and-so's house. And this is this, and this is the area. And she goes, how did you know? I said, well, I had to climb that building to assassinate someone over there. <laughs> she said, please don't say that out loud. <laughs> but through the journey of playing these games, no matter what kind of game it is, you are walking through an area, a time, a history, a culture, and you are picking up things about that time, that culture, that history that you, you don't realize that you're picking up. And it's a way to teach people um, the right way to live, how to do the right thing, the right way to act. And don't get me wrong, it's not all positive. It has its negatives too. But I think its negatives have been spoken about so consistently that people start to forget the positives that are right. there. Interesting. How many positives in Fortnite? Teaching good things to kids in Fortnite? Teamwork, All communication, right. uh, accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about how the industry is changing. In some ways it's mimicking other forms of media like TV and film. We've got streaming, we've got subscriptions, uh, we've got expensive production budgets. What do you think are the main trends? Well, there was a, a large trend of pay to play where you buy the game, you play it as much as you want, towards free to play where the business model is more around the advertising and the micro-purchases. Um, and we talk about micro-purchases, you know, in one to five dollars. And people think, well, how can you make money when you're selling things for that low? And I say, there's one of the larger esports tournaments in the world is for Dota 2. And the prize pool for that tournament 
the company uh, Valve that runs it or owns it put up six million dollars in prize pool and they added to the prize pool 10% of the sales of the week of the championship and the prize pool last year if I'm not mistaken was somewhere around 36 million dollars so that goes to show those micro purchases can really add up when you start talking about the volume of people that are taking mm. part and then with the advent of new technologies new social medias web3 uh, and all of that you're starting to move from free to play to paid to play where actually playing becomes the way you earn money not just the way you spend money um, and it's that evolution is, is something that's it's interesting it's taking its time and I will gladly admit that I don't fully understand it <laughs> but I don't have to uh, this next generation are living it they are they are the ones that are pushing the innovation um, and our job and what we're doing in Saudi and globally is putting the tools in place for them to take it and run with it and take the lead and we can get out of their way. It's also a very international industry, right? So in, in, in TV and media, the United States still dominates. I think 17 out of the 20 highest grossing films were American, but in mobile gaming, the top 20 games were made by nine different countries, including China, South Korea, Japan, Israel, with players all over the world. So talk about what kind of opportunities that offers. Well, it's, we're in an interesting time in gaming because the tools to create the games are now accessible to everyone. Things like Unreal Engine, Unity. And you have the ability now, one of the biggest aspects of the growth of gaming is indie gaming. So it's the small budget, uh, the games that are focused on story rather than graphics. Um, and those are usually then bought up by the big players and then created into the big franchises. But you are now in a time where you have the ability to take those indie games with those indie budgets, but make the same quality as the AAA games. Um, and so you're starting to see more of the stories come out there, uh, more of the individual aspects of it become more prevalent because it becomes something that everyone can play mm -hmm. and it's not something that needs to be picked up by one of the big players although that does help but when we talk about again the interaction between media or you know tv film uh, music gaming is bigger than all three combined mm. and I, I spoke to members of my team who are all much smarter than i and i asked them to explain this to me like they would to my seven-year-old son. And they said to me, to break it down into its simplest terms, uh, Avatar was one of the biggest movie franchises of all time. And its revenues have almost reached three billion US dollars. Pokemon, the game, mm -hmm. uh, is one of the more popular games, not the most, but one of the more popular games. Its revenues have reached around 90 billion. Uh, in the same amount of time. Hmm. Uh, so just to give a, That's again, extraordinary. the reach is just in a different scale. So in rich countries, I believe about two thirds of people play games. Nearly half of them actually are women. One quote I found that I loved uh, said that gamers are no longer just young guys covered in crisps. <laughs> so, but that actually isn't true across the world. I mentioned, you know, the Seoul Game Academy uh, as a place where you can go in South Korea to learn to become a pro gamer, 99% of the students are male. So how can we make gaming more inclusive? So as you said, when we talk about gaming, uh, esports is a much smaller cup. Uh, in gaming, it is pretty equal. Even in Saudi, it's about 48% female, 52% male. Mm -hmm. if we talk about the gaming community. Uh, similar, uh, it's about 49% when you talk about the online um, uh, personalities and streamers. Uh, it's about 49% female, 51% male. Where we have a lot of room to catch up is in the professional gamers. Okay. Um, there's a lot of room for women to grow in that. And there's a lot of growth that's happened in the last, I would say, probably five years. And that's worldwide, not just in Saudi. Um, in Saudi, we've had uh, our first national, uh, international champion, uh, Najd Al Fahad who won the collegiate FIFA World Championship, um, the ladies' championship. And she has, we're, she's one of our role models to showcase that this is a valid career path, not just for our young men, but also for our young women. Mm. And what we need to do is give more room 
for our young men and women to showcase that they are the heroes of the future and let them be the voice of the next generation. And once um, our young men and women see that this is a valid career path and their parents see that this is a valid career path and we can showcase to them the healthy way to do it and the healthy way to move forward. And we focus on that consistently uh, in Saudi. We talk about not just the physical health, the mental health and the social health. Because again, we're talking about a group of young men and women who are at the, the right age when they learn their social skills and their social cues. So how can we use this as a tool to give them a career for the future and not just as a professional esports player, but in the industry, game creation, storytelling, production, uh, law, uh, finance. I mean, there's so many different avenues that literally anything you have a passion for, anything that you enjoy doing, there's a career path within gaming for it. Interesting. So for me, gaming is the place where the metaverse becomes exact. You just know what the metaverse is when you think about gaming. And I wonder what esports and the metaverse future fused looks like. Well, this is, the metaverse is always an interesting conversation for me because it's very confusing. Uh, there's lots of different people who talk about the metaverse in different terms from different points of view. But when you talk about gaming, I asked someone to explain to me in the simplest terms, what is a metaverse? And they said, it's when your online world is equal to or more important than your real, your real world. Mm. So that's commerce, that's social, that's you know, family, friends. And when you talk about that in gaming, we've been there for 20 plus years, where people have had their commerce in gaming, they've had their lives, their social lives, their education, um, using gaming as education tools. And so the other aspect of the metaverse, when you talk about the investment, when you talk about buying property and you know, the, these big brands and everything that's happening in the metaverse, they're at one level and everyone else is over here. Right. And we're slowly inching together. But until those two places meet, where the mass, which are generally speaking the gamers, reach that, that platform and the, the conversation up here comes down to the, the level where everyone can participate, that's when you'll start to see the boom. Uh, and th what's taking us there is the advent of Web3 gaming, which is again, the advent of paid to play, where your career now is playing, not just streaming and doing other things. Um, and it becomes a way to really democratize the income <clears throat> that is generated from gaming. Just briefly talk a little bit more about Web3 and the opportunities it'll bring. Well, there's, um, there's a few companies that I've been talking to, again, to understand more. And the opportunity in Web3 gaming is to, again, build that community from end to end, and it's through the blockchain. Rather than focusing on cryptocurrency, they focus on the blockchain, where everything is connected and you can really create that, that system where you as a gamer, you as a seller, you as a producer can really benefit from the whole chain. And where that starts to bring people together is right now, for example, if you are a, um, call a League of Legends player, they have what they call skins that you purchase. So you can essentially dress your player in the way that you see fit and customize your player. But there are similar games, Dota and among others, where the metaverse and Web3 can start to change things is you can create something, a skin, in League of Legends, but sell it to someone who plays Dota 2, mm. which is two separate publishers, two separate platforms. But now you have that interaction, that communication. We're not quite there yet, but once you have that, once it all becomes one metaverse, for no better way to call it, that's where everyone can start to grow together and it becomes everyone can participate uh, rather than just being niche clans or niche groups in separate, uh, separate universes. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to hearing about Gamers 8 for in 2023 <laughs> and hearing who wins that. So thank you very much, Royal Highness. And please, thank let's you. give him a huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>